Hello, uh, my name is Paul Gilwood and I'm president of the Compassionate Mind Foundation. And this is part of the Creating a Compassionate World series of interviews. And I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome um, David Story today. And we, we had a conversation uh, a few months ago about some of his work in South Africa during the truth and reconciliation period. And that's what our conversation is going to focus on. Since then, he's moved on and doing other things. So I'll just briefly read you his background and then we can begin. So David is now a partner at EY, but in the early 1990s was the deputy director of the Witzvall region of the National Peace Secretariat. Today, we are talking about lessons from peace building and peacekeeping activities in South Africa in the period leading up to the first democratic elections in 1994. David was involved in the mediation of political violence and peacekeeping processes, electoral administration and policing reform during the South African transition to democracy. He also spent several years in student and community based anti apartheid activism. He has a BCom LLB from the University of Witwatersrand and an LLM from Harvard Law School, where he was a Fulbright Scholar. David, welcome. And um, uh, as I say, you know, we, I, we started our conversation looking at not so much what you're doing today, but all of the amazing experiences you have from that period of time when South Africa was transcending from right to the, where it is today. And uh, so how did you get involved with that whole process and some of the peacekeeping work that you did? I guess it's probably worth drawing out at the start, just the context. Um, formal negotiations between the ANC, which ultimately took over government in 1994 with the first democratic elections, between the ANC and what was then the apartheid government um, had been going on in the background, but really kicked off uh, late 80, 89 probably. Um, and with the release of Mandela and the legitimization of what had been banned political parties, there began a transition period, let's say from 1990 to 94, when the elections took place. And I would describe that transition period as, from a macro political perspective, as a, a period of dual powerlessness, in that you had a government which did not have the legitimacy to govern. Um, and, and it had recognized that illegitimacy by beginning the negotiations um, and by unbanning political parties. And, and you know, it was, it was clearly going to lead up to an election and they were clearly going to lose it. But you always had a liberation movement which wasn't in a position to lead. They didn't have their hands on believers of power. Um, they could scupper things. They could certainly make themselves known on different issues. But for four years, you had to have a country which operated and you know, be that on foreign affairs where the ANC started getting involved during that period of time, you know, our nuclear um, capability was disarmed, for example. Uh, but at a, at a micro level, on a local level, uh, where there was a lot of violence, you also had a situation where there wasn't one party which had the authority or the capability to put an end to that violence. And just to give you a sense of the violence, you know, even in the heady days of apartheid, 86 to 89, which was some of the more, most repressive um, period with states of emergency, you're only talking, I say only, but you're talking about about four and a half, five thousand 5,000 people dying. Um, during the transition period, which should have been a period which was far more peaceful, uh, where there'd been a, a release of the political pressure through the unbannings, et cetera, but instead 13,000 people uh, were dying um, on an annual basis. So, you know, a, a three, three times multiple increase in violence. And that violence was taking place primarily in uh, black townships um, around and about major urban centers. I lived in Johannesburg um, with some of the, the biggest of those type of townships around us. And during that period of time, um, certainly from 1990, there was extreme violence um, taking place on a daily basis um, and affecting many millions of people. So within that context and within, you know, within the notion that it was very hard for the political parties to reach a settlement on the future when there was so much provocation and pain taking place with the current, um, they got together and did something quite extraordinary, which was to 
sign a peace accord. So it was the first formal agreement that was signed of, uh, between the ANC and the government. Didn't just involve, the, there were a couple of interesting things to it. One is it didn't just involve the government. Individual arms of the government had to sign separately. So for example, the police, the defense force and the intelligence services um, had signatories on an independent basis because they were seen as players um, in the conflict. It wasn't just the ANC who signed. Uh, altogether, there were 36 parties who signed. So from national taxi associations, national business associations, um, a variety of political parties, different movements within those political parties, and pretty much everybody who was either part of or being impacted by the violence uh, signed up to this peace accord. The second extraordinary thing about it was that it was a, a consensus pact that was being signed, but it was given statutory authority. So um, an institution was set up to drive it. There was a budget provided to it, um, all quite controversial at the time because even the notion of taking government money or, or having something funded by the Department of Justice, you know, didn't necessarily aid the credibility um, of what took place. So you've got a lot of violence, you've got a nascent institution which has been set up with big ideas and, and uh, lots of potential and lots of good intentions, but until it actually manifested on the ground and started to make a difference in people's lives um, and started to decrease violence, it wasn't going to do anything um, or make a difference. And it's a long answer to what was a short question, which was how did you get involved? I was one of the first people that was appointed as um, formal mediators to go in and set up um, localized peace committees where we were replicating the national peace accord structure at a community level and then using the multi-party format at that local level to try and negotiate um, key agreements which would uh, help to decrease the violence and also to physically monitor those agreements, which very often related to different forms of public uh, protest and public um, action, uh, often those would lead to violence. So we wouldn't just come up with an agreement. Uh, we would often, or we would always be there and physically place ourselves in between different parties and be available to negotiate um, and mediate on the site agreements um, to try and um, both prevent violence, but also to resolve it when it took place. Yeah, I mean, I think that's extraordinary. We can go into detail about that in a moment, but you see what you're demonstrating is saying is very important for compassion is both courage and wisdom. And uh, those two things together are absolutely vital when you're going to bring compassion into these sorts of processes. And of course, the key motivation for you is to try to prevent suffering, in this case, violence, obviously, and how to resolve tribal conflicts. and. Uh, uh, obviously what had happened was a lot of pent up anger on both sides, which just get released in these sorts of situations. So how did you go from those sort of ideas about mediating these groups, which were very dangerous for you to be doing, um, to actually doing them? What, were, what did you actually do? Look, I come from a background, I was schooled in dispute resolution and South Africa had already had a very rich history of dispute resolution through through formal conflict management processes like negotiation, mediation, arbitration, et cetera. Um, we all cut our teeth in the in labor disputes, um, but increasingly we're doing community disputes as well. So we had a, we had a playbook to go in on. Um, we knew which parties to contact um, and there was, there was sufficient um, support at a national and regional level from those parties to help us find and identify all the right people in those communities and then convene. So we had convening power, but that's pretty much all we had initially. Once you got them together, um, they were, I think it would be fair to say, quite reticent to see themselves as agents of change themselves. Instead, they felt they were sitting in a meeting waiting for this institution to do something um, about what was taking place. So they arrived there um, quite happy to blame each other. Um, for, for recent and ongoing violence. They arrived there um, thinking this was a place in which to lodge complaints and to, to register things. Uh, they arrived there thinking that this was a place where they would get help. But I don't think they necessarily arrived there thinking we are the help um, and that simply by convening um, and then 
being willing to open up to the opportunity to think differently, very differently, and act differently around certain things, um, albeit in their interest, um, and still, still further in their interest, um, that in fact they could make a difference themselves. Um, and it, I guess one of my first meetings is a good description of that. Um, I, I arrived um, in this particular um, township called Fosslerus on the east end of Johannesburg. And the night before, there had been a lot of violence. Um, there had been a, a Shabin, which is an informal drinking house shooting. Uh, six or seven people had died uh, from that. They'd been gunned down uh, by a masked gunman. Uh, there had been a number of, of city councillor houses which had been demolished by um, a group which had got hold of a bulldozer and literally bulldozed over their houses um, while they slept. There had been a, uh, an RPG attack on a, on a, on a hostel, uh, a men's only hostel, uh, which, was, which was mainly uh, occupied by, by Zulu-speaking um, people, um, and a, a number of other incidents that had happened. So there pretty much mayhem had taken place the night before. When we arrived, um, convene everybody. Um, there were people in the room who'd suffered loss. So they weren't just there as representatives. They actually, you know, they, they knew people who had died or were affected. Um, I'm pretty sure there were people in the room who'd actually done some of it, um, who'd pulled the trigger, uh, or at least given the order um, for some of that work. And it, it very quickly turned into a, um, a blaming game on both, on both sides. Tempers were getting heated. And I struggled. In, in chairing the meeting and working with them because I couldn't find an in. I couldn't find a way in which we could start flipping that, 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 um, that agency uh, mentality that, 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 I, that I spoke about. Um, we couldn't get agreement. The issues were moving around. Emotions were going up. And eventually I just I stopped it. And I said, look, uh, we're early days on this. The community is looking to us to, to help. Our credibility is going to be at stake. Um, if we can't agree on what to do, the very least we can do is to go out and visit all the incidents, the, the, the places where these incidents took place, and offer our condolences to those affected. And there was a silence which um, crossed the room. And then one of the, uh, the ANC people said, look, we, we can't do that, David. And I said, why not? And he said, we can't go in that area. That's a no-go zone. We'll, we'll be killed if we go there. And uh, some of the encounter people said, well, we can't go in that area because it's a no-go zone and we'll be killed if we go there. And it just, it just dawned on me, here's my issue. Here's something I can, here's something I can mediate. Um, here's something I can craft a solution around with them. And within 45 minutes, we put together a solution as to um, what vehicles people would travel in, the fact that all the vehicles would be, have a combined presence of different warring factors so that uh, factions, they have to sit next to each other, um, but they will protect each other. The police and army would be providing protection in a different way. This was the route we would take. These are the ones we would visit first. This is how long we would spend at each one. And in a very practical way, put together um, a solution. Um, and off we went, got in the vehicles, people hadn't done this before, and out we went. And what took place then was extraordinary because as I said, there were people both affected and who probably pulled the trigger or been involved. They had to, you know, greet a widow um, on the ground in tears, traditional blankets around her, family members nearby, who was mourning inside a burnt down house, uh, which used to be her house and used to have a loved one living and breathing inside it, which was no longer. They had to offer condolences. Some of those would have shaken those hands with a lot of shame um, and, and, and it would have done a lot of thinking as they did that. But that, you know, as we went, it affected everybody um, and people became quieter and quieter and there was started to become more of a solidarity to the group. And when we finally exited and went out, um, it had made an impact on them. And I think they started to see the beginning of something. Um, and I think we've made a difference to the community at that point in time. And certainly, um, fortunately, my credibility as someone who could help them from the outside was, was, was also um, dramatically improved. And you know, I won't go into all the deals, but from that we built. Um, and what struck us really at that, at that time was, um, was the power of putting people together and giving them, giving them responsibility for each other's lives. And from that, we built out a, an active monitoring component, which ended up being 
5,000 volunteer monitors in total um, in hundreds of hired car vehicles, um, protected only by magnetic signage, you know, which said peace accord on it, um, little high, vis, high, high visibility vests, which said peace accord on it. Um, I kid you not, dial sticks with flags that said peace accord on it. We had the dial sticks so that when, when we moved in crowds, we could put a flag up and if one of us went down, people would notice that the flag had dropped and, and help could come. But there was no bulletproof vest, there was no, you know, there were no weapons, no anything else. We, we started to be able to, to monitor, to make a difference, to be able to intervene simply on a brand, a brand which was that we're different, we're not one of the warring parties, um, you can recognize us. But the extraordinary thing about that brand is that the brand was built on different warring parties wearing those high visibility vests. So we didn't have, these monitors were not all third party monitors like myself. What we did was for every vehicle, for every grouping, we made sure that there was one in Carter person, one ANC person, and then one uh, third party person, at least in a, in a vehicle. And what that meant was that, that car could drive into a hostile area um, and the encounter person could put their head out the window and say, open up, it's me, I take responsibility for us in, in this vehicle, and they could go in. And if they went into another part of the community, which was an ANC controlled area, um, the ANC person could put their head out the window and say, it's me, let us in. So you had two warring parties who on a regular basis would put a high visibility vest on and become something else completely. And that other thing that they became was very powerful and became highly needed by both sides. And that, that gave us the credibility to really you know, get into you know, both mediating and building point solutions for a, you know, for a funeral or a march that was potentially gonna to lead to violence, but also starting to look structurally at certain things like you know, everybody had to go to work when they could. The only way to get to work in those places is through a taxi rank. If the taxi rank was gonna become a war zone, both sides suffer. No one can get to work. So you, know, you figure out an interest, you sit down and say, guys, why don't we work on making that a neutral zone? And then you've got something to negotiate. And it's in both their interest to do it because both their interests have people who wanna to go to work and need to earn money, et cetera. So we work out what would that require? What does that, what does that mean from a behavior perspective? What, what would that mean from a, from a security perspective? What does that mean from a, um, from a monitoring perspective? And we'd work it out and we'd put it together and step-by-step, step, brick by brick, those things started to make a difference. And then obviously there was the, the regular monitoring of, of, the, of the kind of flashpoint things like marches, funerals, and other forms of crowds um, gathering, which were, in South Africa were always either targets or were, were going to be, you know, could turn into a mob very quickly um, and, and commit violence. It's an extraordinary story, isn't it? So, I mean, there's so many points to pick up there. I mean, one of them, I suppose, is to take you back to the beginning of the story where you thought, how can we get this group together? And that idea about, okay, let's see if we could go and offer condolences. I mean, from a psychological point of view, I think that's really interesting because it's a massive shift in motivation. And we have something a little bit like that in what is called restorative justice, where um, people kind of meet their perpetrators meet their victims and so forth. And that does seem to produce a change in psychology, but you sort of came up with that yourself, didn't you? You didn't sort of, I, I don't know, maybe you didn't know about the psychology of that, but I mean, that's quite an extraordinary shift to perceive that if you could change their orientation uh, into doing something positive and stimulate a different motivation within them, then they, you had a chance of getting them to work together. I, I wasn't aware of the concept behind it at the time, but um, I think a lot of it comes down to if you create regular opportunities for people to see the humanness of the yeah. other, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you're going to get something. So, you know, we we didn't stop at simply hosting regular meetings. We we trained all of those parties in dispute resolution, um, you think, well, that's a bit strange. You're training them in dispute resolution, but they, they, you know, they're, they're involved in it. But you know what? Them understanding what a mediator's job is properly, conceptually, theoretically understanding what a mediator does made my job a lot simpler. Mm. They could hold me accountable, but it also, they also knew what I was doing. Training them in negotiation where they could understand the difference between 
positions and interests meant that they could formulate their negotiating positions and understand their interests better. That allowed me a greater opportunity to be able to work with them and move them from positions to interests on a regular basis. But the fascinating thing was training them together where they had to role play together, um, where, they, where they had to go on a learning journey together, where even though they are the enemies and you know, there was severe dislike and distrust between them, each shared experience, each common knowledge base, each, you know, each one is a brick, which just gives you that, that little bit more momentum to be able to work with them and come up with something that, that can make a difference, however small um, in, in a particular instance. So over time, they got to know each other really well. Over time, we saw friendships develop. We saw, we saw people on both sides of the divide choosing you know, regularly to work with that person because they, they trusted them. They built up trust. They knew they could work together. It's quite hard to go back to you know, outright, outright hatred um, and dehumanizing when you, when, you, when you regularly have to unwind that um, for those people, for those leaders. So it made a big difference. And look, they had to, you know, I, I, I have the greatest respect for all of them. I mean, they had, to, they had to watch their constituencies. Their constituencies were not in the room. Their constituencies were not going through the training, were not um, having those experiences and their constituencies were bleeding and suffering. So, you know, I had numerous instances where I'd have some of those leaders on the phone at three o'clock in the morning saying, you know, I don't know what to do. I think I'm going to be killed because I'm being seen as too soft now or I've, you know, I've, I'm, I'm being distrusted that I've, I've, I've given in or, or somehow I've been bought out um, in this process because I'm pushing my constituency too far um, in terms of where they are at, at the moment. So, you know, you're working with them, you're working between them and their constituencies. You, you, it, it, it was a fascinating period of time and lots of lessons learned. Yeah, so no, I mean, again, what strikes me is not only your own personal courage, but the way you were able to stimulate quite a lot of courage in your participants and the people that were engaged with that, because it does sound extremely frightening to be doing this if you're getting uh, threats at three o'clock in the morning. I mean, that's so how did they maintain their courageous engagement with the process? What was happening? What were you doing that was stimulating that or supporting that? going to take any responsibility for their courage um people were extraordinary um you know i think of i think of third party monitors who came from the suburbs i'm talking about you know retirees people with no background in this whatsoever um we had to train up from the beginning on you know how to use a walkie-talkie and just who struggled with that with, with some of the things but just were, were saying i need to do something i i, I can't go to sleep at night and know that just 15 kilometers down the road, there are people dying every night and, and I've got an opportunity, you've given me an opportunity to do something, I'm gonna do it. And if something happens, something happens, so be it. Not that, that they wanted it to. Um, how, they were how they were taken in and shielded by the, the other people in their vehicle or squad, um, both from the ANC and Encanto on the whole, um, who would look at this person and go, you don't have to be here. <laughs> what are you doing here? And if, you, if you're choosing to come and help like this, I'm going to help you. And then you had the courage of, you know, I can recall incidents where, you know, monitors literally went in under machetes, you know, literally threw themselves down over, over a body being macheted on the ground. Um, and again, all that was protecting them was a high visibility vest. That's it. Nothing else, right? But the machetes didn't come down again. That person got, you know, was, was able to be placed in a car. That person survived. Um, I think a lot of what drove people after a while was success begets success. Um, none of us did get hurt. Uh, we got threatened on occasion. I mean, you know, we got shot at on occasion. Uh, we, we, we landed up, there were times when you just, you know, you, you made some mistakes in terms of how bold you were or where you, you know, where you went to. Um, there were, there were instances where rough justice was administered. And I can remember one instance where one of our monitors was manhandled and hurt and kidnapped for a while. Um, and I won't say which political party it was, but that political party came to me, apologized, and took me and that monitor out. Um, and it wasn't a pleasant thing, but, but they literally physically disciplined that person in front of us and made a message to the community to say, you do not mess with these guys. You know, um, that's, that's just, it's not on the agenda. Um, sounds terrible now thinking back on it, but but it, it, 
we were in a rough place um, and it, it was about pr protecting everybody. I think people just, yeah, I mean, it took us a long time. I mean, we, we, we eventually brought in counselors to help those people. Um, I knew one night without any doubt that we had a big problem when, um, when I heard two young monitors um, late at night getting into an argument and getting into quite a heated argument. And one of the things they had to fill in when they came back from every trip, just a basic log, one of the things was, did you find any, you know, did you find a body? Because um, they were often first to find um, uh, people who'd been killed. And there was an argument going on between these two. And the reason was that one person, one of them was saying it was half a body. The other one was saying, no, it's a quarter of a body. Um, because they'd found a person who'd been a victim of a necklacing, which when a tire gets placed over your head and petrol filled, is filled into it, and then you set a light. Um, and basically, they'd found the hip bone and femur, and most of a leg and some other parts in a dustbin. Um, and we're now arguing voraciously as to whether it was half or a quarter of a body, at which point I knew we had to we had to get help in quite quickly from a, from a psychological perspective. And fortunately, we did then get counselling for a lot of those people who were regularly being exposed um, to... It's not just the incidents, it's the... Um, I know for myself, um, it's the tension of waiting. You can wait, you can be with a crowd for eight hours. And if you've been around crowds long enough and been in that situation long enough, you know that within 30 seconds, it can go from a hot, sweltering, peaceful crowd um, who seem bored almost into, a, into something that you really do not want to be anywhere near. Um, and it's that notion that the smallest spark, the smallest external provocation, the, the smallest mistake that gets made by somebody, the wrong type of you know, speech, a car that comes around the corner too fast and bumps into someone, anything, and it's going to turn into something completely different. And it's that constant tension that you wait for. Uh, which builds up over, over time and really, you know, gets very difficult um, to deal with. Gosh, I mean, there, again, there's so many things to pick up on. I mean, I suppose one of the key things that I wanted to talk to you about is the fact that even in situations which are really horrific, as you talked about, I mean, tribal violence has been, you know, the curse of humanity. I mean, we've done some dreadful things, you know, you think of the Holocaust on a big scale, we will putting people into concentration camps and things as well. So humans have a terrible dark side, but the thing that really struck me about how you talked about it is that nevertheless, there are ways in which you can help people kind of overcome the aspect of, their, of themselves. They can have, overcome hatred if you can create certain conditions, which is obviously something that you did, but to do that, you need a lot of wisdom and a lot of courage. I mean, how, how did it affect you? I mean, you talk about bringing in counselors for other people, but it must have had a massive impact on yourself. Uh, it, it did. I, I wouldn't do any of that again um, at my age now. Um, well, not at my age. I just, I, when I think back on it, I just, yeah, I wouldn't be putting up my hand for it. Um, at the time, unfortunately, it becomes, like a lot of other things, it becomes a drug. Um, the proximity to the action, the 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 ability to see to, you know, to be in the crucible and to be able to make a difference in itself on a selfish basis becomes addictive mm. um it's a lot like you know i think war journalists you, you you feel a guilt because you you're there but you're not you're not part of it but you're there um and in fact your job is to be where the action is and to be where the horrible stuff is and um yeah, you need you need to balance that out, and, and I, I was I was a lot younger, and but yeah, I, I was fortunate. I, I, went, I studied. I, I got got a Fulbright, and I, when I exited for a year, I I didn't realize at the time, but it took me six months before I could even you know I could concentrate really. I was I was um, I was needing that break um, by the by the time I went, and uh, I've done a lot of therapy since. Um, but yeah, those were those were very different days, um, and you. You get into things in a particular way. You don't, you don't necessarily, you know, envisage exactly where it's going to turn out when you begin the journey. You just keep putting one foot in front of the other and and find yourself doing doing some things that you probably wouldn't have signed up for. Yes. And you've not, have you have you ever written your story? Have you written ever written your Bible? Because it is a fascinating story and a very heartening one, full of hope. If we can get the courage and the wisdom that you showed, I mean. 
have you ever thought about writing your story? Um, uh, maybe at another point when I'm when I'm uh, when I'm when I've got more time. I think there are very valuable things to be learned from it. Um, I mean, it, it's not all. I wouldn't. It's not all kumbaya by, by any means. I mean, I think I think part of the lesson of all of that work was that you do have to focus on interests. If you don't, there were some hard political interests being displayed on, you know, by different groupings that 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 were there. Um, I think some of them, if they'd had a choice, if, if they think they could have won it through through force, if, if they'd had the weapons and the trained people and the access, I think some of them probably would have said, we'd rather do it this way. You know, if we could have ended this problem by killing all 20,000 of those people that, you know, on, were on the other side, um, I think some of them would have chosen that, even while working in peace accord structures. They just didn't have that choice. So in, in that in that notion of not having a choice, then you can offer them another choice and, and you can start to work with that um, as, as, as you go forward. Um, yeah, there were some extraordinary times. I mean, I think when I think particularly of there was a week in South Africa's history, which most people who were there at the time acknowledge was the most critical of all weeks. Um, it was the week that it could have gone completely off, 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 um, off the ledge. And that was in um, April 92, when, uh, when Chris Harney, um, who was probably the most popular ANC leader outside of Mandela, um, was assassinated. And it was an assassination which um, they in fact caught the person who did it, um, but it, you know, it was designed to provoke mass violence in the country. It, it, the, the people who thought it up and the people who executed against it wanted to do something so heinous uh, that would upset um, the, the majority of black population so much that it would break out into an all out civil war, which would force the military to act in a much more heavy handed way, which would then throw the country off on a completely different uh, chart and wreck negotiations. And during that week, from the day he died to the day he was buried, um, was an extraordinary week of, of manufacturing solutions, mediating solutions at national level through some of my colleagues, at regional level at, um, and at local level in multiple places. And on any given day during the week, that week, there would have been somewhere between a million and one and a half million people marching in different places, to different destinations, doing different things all over the area around us, all of which um, often led to violence or had to be dealt with. Um, entire cities were trashed, um, uh, except where our monitoring was there. We, we literally got in between the plate glass windows wow. and protesters, wow. um, and nothing happened. There was one window broken in the whole of Johannesburg. Um, so the most populous city, the most city which should have been the biggest, had the biggest problems, uh, one plate glass window broken. Cape Town, trashed. Durban, trashed. Port Elizabeth, trashed. East London, trashed um, during that time. And th the funerals took place in, um, in, uh, around us. And we, we managed those funerals and we managed the, um, we, we managed the, the joint operation centers between police, intelligence, military, you know. Uh, I mean, I'm literally, you know, when you're talking about, when you're talking about, planes circling above, uh, loaded with jeeps um, already there with, with parabats and, um, and, and light machine guns ready to come down because that was what was anticipated. Helicopters with special forces, an incredible array of things. Um, and the agreements that could get settled in that process because we had all the political parties there, even on the spot. Um, you know, I'll give an example of a strange agreement, but there was an agreement that the ANC found out that there would be AWB were pretty much neo-Nazi, not even neo-Nazi, it's called the Nazis, um, Nazi right-wing uh, Afrikaner group at that stage um, who were placing men with rifles um, on the roofs of houses overlooking the cemetery where the entire national executive of the ANC would be um, for the cemetery. Um, they had permission to do that because the homeowners gave them permission and they legally allowed to carry arms, but they were now on the roof. The agreement that got struck was that for every AWB person on a roof, there would be a police sniper on another roof aiming at that person. Wow, wow, wow. So, you know, and the AWB was told that, that every single one of them would have a 
police sniper trained on them for that entire time. Yeah, it, it was crazy stuff, but we made it. There's no question that there were some things that happened on on those days, which you could write a book just on that on that week. And a number of you know a number of the key um, political party representatives and others have started to, you know, there'd been a chapter here or there that started to come out of people's biographies. But um, the whole week needs to be written up at some point. Yes, it certainly does because um, I mean I was just so amazed and uh, you know by your story when we talked about your story because you know there's so many nuggets of wisdom there because as you say tribal violence is the curse of humanity it's caused so much suffering and as you see in Ukraine and other places continues to do so so you know anything that we have for dealing with that and you know we've got a what's going to happen in the post-Ukraine era when they have to try and sort out the hatred because of course it's all based on hatred isn't it um it would be extremely valuable and again, I come back to this whole issue about, you know, the, the two twin things that you're showing this, this wisdom of what to do with the dedication to try to prevent the suffering that would be caused through this one. That is quite extraordinary, really, quite extraordinary. And as you say, you know, listening to your story, all these new ways of dealing with it, like having a police marksman on top of rooftops and things. But I mean, it's it just amazing, amazing. I suppose the ultimate listening is it everything can be negotiated yeah, yeah if you get down to it um and introducing formalized dispute resolution training even if it's not used in time but just just it starts to shift protagonist mindsets um gives them a different way of 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 looking at things even if it just allows people to stay cool um in a room with each other for a period of time rather than it escalating too you know too too fast um, core concepts, you know, position, interests, you know, just, just being able to, if you get that through, you can start making a difference. And then I think, as you say, on the courage side, just finding a way where there's an, where you can actually act, where you can almost physically, even if it's symbolic, but you can start doing something that takes you away just from talking. Um, and if, the, if you get the combination right and it starts to build, something special um, can happen. Every situation is different. Every context is different. Um, every historical, you know, background is, is is different, but I I think there is there is scope out there for more work on, particularly at a localized level, who are always the people who suffer the most. Um, it's easy it's easy being a national politician who's belligerent and 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 can warmonger. It's much harder when you are living in it, and it's your family uh, that'll take the hit. Um, and it's your house that'll get burned down, and it's you know it's, it's it's your job that you'll lose because you can't go to work any longer or, or otherwise. Um, it's it's at that level that that I think there's the most scope and potential. It's also the hardest, but there's the most scope and potential. Yes, and you make the key point: you must bring people together, ideally, for face-to-face -face contact, so they can see each other and they can understand this concept of shared interests rather than a shared position very 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 important point that you make about that but also that they you can begin to experience the other person as a fellow human being not as a monster not to dehumanize them that you have to kind of talk to them and, and hear about their interests as well so i think all of those things are fundamental because one of the ways in which um violence is maintained is by keeping people separate keeping them, keeping that desire never to fraternize or find anything out about your enemy that's regarded as bad. Whereas what you are what you were doing is saying, no, no, rather than seeing us as enemies, let's come together with joint interests. We're all caught up in this tribal violence, whatever side you're on, and how can we actually do things that will kind of try and settle this part of our personalities down. Um, so again, I, you have so many important things to say about how we create safe places for people to be able to negotiate because sometimes in international negotiations they say you know war won't finish until people are tired of it but i think you're making something a much more important process that if you can bring people together with joint interests uh, and help them support each other in a way and that you did 
and, and help them pay attention to the consequences of their destructive behavior. That's another very important thing we find in, in criminal work as well, to really be faced with the human consequences of what you're doing. All of those things brought together really creates a lot of hope for the future, really. Look, I think there is something to be said for the in the conflict resolution world, we call it the ripeness of the dispute. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's a lot easier mediating something when the dispute is ripe, when both sides are tired, when they've suffered enough, you know, loss, and when, they, when they're starting to have doubt about their ability to yeah, you know, win um, in, that, in that situation. But I do think you can, you can push people to get to that point faster um, yeah. if, if you're starting to think um, of, 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 of how you work with the interests and how you yeah, I, how you point out that this, there isn't going to be a winner here. Um, there just isn't going to be a winner. So the, the question is, how long does it go on? Um, and, and how badly do you lose? And if you're going to shift off that to something different, then both sides are going to have to engage in different ways. And you know, there's still going to be a recognition of ultimate, the power balance has to be recognized inside there, but there, there can be a a faster, more humane way of, of, of getting there. And again, at the local level, something, something where you can get your bread and butter, something, something that is, is there where people can understand if that happens tomorrow, I'm better off from that. Not, not, not something airy fairy in the sky that someone else is signing. Yeah, this community based stuff is so important. I mean, you can see it maybe in drug gangs and all kinds of situations where you know you're getting all these different groups at war with each other particularly that bring in these young males that don't seem to have much future in various parts of the world and then they just fight each other and so on so i mean a, a lot of what you're saying has such a huge potential for so many areas of conflict particularly as you say at a local level uh, because trying to do top-down resolutions and solutions doesn't tend to work very much. But you, what you need is people on the ground who have your vision, have your wisdom, have your courage. And those are the people that you engaged as well. And I think that's key. So the, the, the know-how, but also having people who are prepared to put themselves on the line. And trusting that if you create the space, yeah. there are people there who, if they had the alternative to what they were in, they might choose the alternative rather than stay where they are. Um, and we just saw many, you know, example after example of people displaying enormous courage, enormous personal leadership, um, enormous willingness to, to identify in a different way in, in, in that milieu um, and to, to, to choose not to be a combatant when, when you gave them a choice that there was another way, um, that you could still actively be be trying to help protecting your community, um, doing your part, but it doesn't have to be on one side or the other. There's, there's another way. Um, that, that, that was very powerful for some people. And I think that's probably a good place to begin to kind of wrap up because it's such a message of hope, such a message of hope, you know, because people often think when you get into these tribal conflicts that actually it's, it's, there is no resolution. It's just, as you say, despair and, and and who is the strongest is going to suppress the other side but what you're saying is is really really important and I think it has implications for so many areas including policing in, in you know drug gang areas and so on and so on uh, so much so much of what you've been saying really resonates with me in terms of conflict resolution uh, particularly when there's a whole range of violence you know. to emphasize that the, for the police to have to be in when they came in that room they were an ordinary member of the yeah, group. Yeah, yeah. They were one of 22 or one of 36 or one of, you know, around the table. Obviously, they held a particular kind of power formally outside, just like obviously some of those people had militants with guns outside. But forcing them into it as well was, was a very interesting, they took a long time to get their heads around, but, but over time, seeded more and, you know, they would be arriving saying, this is going to happen, or we don't want to have to deal with that, or you know, we think this forum is a better place to to to, to manage that particular issue um, because they saw that I was working for them at the same time. So it can make a big difference. Um, that the power of convening can be very powerful. Mm. It's very, as you say, it's a change in brain state. It's a change of orientation, not just to see good people, bad people. We have to defend the good people against the bad people, but 
it's a very different way of thinking about these uh, processes indeed. And if you, you can get the police to think about it like that, and they become, as you say, sort of mediators and bringing groups together and so forth and sharing interests that um, in the way that you're talking about. I mean, the problem with drug gangs causes a lot of money to be made. That's the other side of it. But um, look, D David, it's I've taken up a lot of your time. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to talk to you. And I'm just really stunned that all the wonderful work you've done, the courage that you've shown. And I'm sure that this, um, some of the things you've been talking about today and the ways in which these tribal hatreds can be worked with will be a great message of hope to people. Uh, it just takes wisdom and courage that you showed. And that is the basis of compassion. One last thing. Um, if people wanted to get involved with know more about this work or get involved in any way, do you have any thoughts about how they may do that? There is, um, you asked about books. I haven't written it, but, but, but one of the uh, other mediators who was in, in, involved at that time has just, just published a book. I think it's coming out in a month or two. I'll, I'll, I'll get the details of that and put it down. But otherwise, yeah, by all means, get hold of me. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to talk about it to, to anybody, but nothing written down and this was a long time ago so it's not work that I do every day now although some of my work still involves dispute resolution uh, but ha happy to talk about it great that's wonderful because we are in contact with some colleagues in the in the EU and and so on and so on so look it's been absolutely an honor to to talk to you and uh, thank you for all the brilliant work you've done David well, goodbye for now